Thank you, everybody. And this is actually a very wonderful thing to do. I am somewhat new to the AI space and to know that these conversations happen and that this is something that FAR AI gives as kind of a gift to the world is good to know because I think it is extremely important and probably far more important than you realize that you're kind of here to start a conversation with people that might not be uh, ready to have the conversation in the way that you would want them to, to be. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for, for inviting us. This is my first official speech on AI. For the last 10 years, I've been giving speeches on cannabis. Uh, so uh, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you about how AI should be regulated, because that seems like a really silly thing to tell far AI on uh, my first day giving a speech on AI. So what I'm, I was hoping to do with my time, A, was to introduce you to Fathom and our theory of change. Um, but B, is to walk through, I, to, to go through my, my history real briefly, is uh, I graduated law school uh, and went immediately into Governor Hickenlooper's cabinet in Colorado. And I was working on early childhood education uh, when they legalized cannabis. And the governor called me in and said, now your cannabis czar. Uh, and from that, I've been working on uh, newly emerging regulated issues uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, and so about six years ago, I went to the federal government side and I launched a coalition of strange bedfellows for cannabis, which was essentially addiction specialists, uh, substance abuse specialists, uh, driving while high specialists, youth misuse specialists mixed with alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceutical companies, uh, infrastructure companies, and essentially said, how do you get these weird groups to come together and speak to the federal government with one voice on the fact that the federal government clearly needs to start changing its stance, given the fact that 39 states have already legalized cannabis. Uh, that made me a an expert in strange bedfellow coalitions at the federal side. And then I ran four other coalitions uh, at that side as a partner at a, a public affairs firm. About eight months ago, uh, I live in San Francisco and I was looking around and uh, I, I, I viewed my career as kind of helping society navigate weird transitions that it was about to go through. And I was like, nothing is going to be harder, weirder, uh, more fast paced than AI. And I need to quit my job, uh, which was paying a very healthy salary, uh, and go full time helping figure out how to broaden the conversation uh, around AI so that the rest of society would be prepared. Uh, that led the start up of meeting people like Bree. Uh, and meeting people like Blake Pearson, our CEO, along with our, our funders, to start raising a fund literally for the purpose of, uh, of broadening that conversation and starting to consensus build around the broad uh, array of voices that probably should have a point of view on AI, don't know that they should have a point of view on AI, and should probably want something fairly similar to what people like Bar AI would want on AI if only they had enough time uh, to think it through. So today with the time, I'd love to just walk through lessons learned from the past about how to build uh, a policy movement uh, in an emerging field. Uh, this is not AI specific. This is just what I've learned from the past. That being said, like these are much better if you guys start interrupting me all over the all over the place, double clicking on stuff, pushing back on where I'm going with it, and uh, and, and in general just being an open uh, open conversation. So quickly again on Fathom, we are a 501c3. Uh, our mission is to help uh, everyone from the business community to civic organizations to everyday people uh, communicate and uh, make sense of their hopes and fears when it comes to AI and figure out how to create policy around that. All right, so here is my, um, my only lessons. And again, there's nothing sacred here. So if you disagree with what I'm saying, uh, I would love to hear from you, um, but uh, this is my general view of how to get from here to there when it comes to an emerging uh, issue, and in general, whenever you want to pass any policy. So if, if I were coming in and I was still uh, a uh, partner at a public affairs firm in DC, these are the four things I would start off with as, as I was evaluating what you guys have and where we would go with policy from there. So the first thing you always want to think through is what island am I trying to land on? Um, what am I trying to get accomplished policy-wise? Uh, and how big of a lift is that? Uh, I had um, one of the first things I ever tried to do in politics was uh, raise everybody's taxes to go to early childhood education. And we went out into the field to, to 
test uh, how early childhood education folds uh, in Colorado. And we were like, the evidence is so clear that a dollar in early childhood education is like one of the best things you can do for society. And like we like presented that and we came back and the, it pulled at 33%. 33% of people thought it was an important thing uh, to, to fund in Colorado. And our stakeholders were like, well, clearly they just don't understand uh, how important early childhood education is. And so that should be our campaign. And the campaign manager at the time said, okay, you can have that campaign. That's a long campaign, trying to convince people that something that they don't currently think needs to be a thing. That's 10 years, 20 years. My job is if you're trying to land something next year is to land on the island they already agree on. And that totally changed my mindset of what a campaign actually is. So I have put it into a couple of different categories. Um, there's some lower lifts that don't really require you changing the conversation uh, in all of the, the country in order to uh, get policy done. A technical fix is a, a good way to think about that, right? There are thousands and thousands of laws that actually get passed at the US government side, all mainly under like omnibus legislation, uh, all on consent calendars. It's still hard, you have to find the right vehicle, you gotta make sure no one disagrees with you, but you can get technical fixes through. Kinda, as long as you you have a good lobby game and um, and you don't really need to go out and take the temperature and make sure this is the right thing to do for America. The second thing you can think about is that there's an emergency policy change. This might be um, a boat just ran into a bridge and it turns out our na navigational systems on boats is not properly uh, regulated and calibrated for. We need to make sure those safety checks look better. Um, we have a recent emergency. Uh, this is the top of everybody's mind. Um, we could go poll this right now. We don't need to. We all know it polls at 95%. And we're really in this kind of end game right away of how do you get something over the finish line rather than changing the conversation in America. The third is that you have to kill something. If you have to kill something, you still want to do a lot of these other things like, like build a winning coalition to kill it. But it is so much easier to kill something than it is to uh, create a piece of legislation and get that legislation all the way through. If you have to kill something, really what you're looking for in that whole dynamic is <clears throat> where are the weak links along the process that we can start creating wedge issues? Uh, and those wedge issues could be amongst the coalition members that are pushing the issue. Those uh, wedge issues might be uh, that it's going to go in front of a committee chair and that committee chair has taken a point of view on preemption before. And even though preemption is a very small thing that you're thinking of, we can wedge it as a preemption issue and this thing will never get heard in committee. And this is where like most of the public gets really, really frustrated because they're like, what are you talking about? That's what this is getting held up with? And the answer is yes, because it's really easy to kill things as it makes its way through Congress uh, or a state legislature. It's why like most corporate jobs are kill jobs. That's a, the, the vast majority of what you have to do is kill stuff. Uh, the next one, which is very hard, um, but not um, impossible, is broadly recognized as not recognized needed policy change. I would put cannabis uh, in, that, in that circle. If you go and you poll somebody on cannabis, they're like, we've already legalized it in our state. Uh, cannabis legalization polls in the almost like 70% at this point. Um, broadly recognized as needed. Um, it's not happening for a number of different reasons, but uh, um, those issues are, that's the, essentially all you have to do is raise up the salience of that issue and create a sense of urgency and you can get those issues to pass. Um, but you don't have to change people's mindsets all that much anymore. 20 years ago, you would have to, but that's no longer where cannabis is a, as an issue area. And the final one is change people's minds. Is your campaign fundamentally going to have to go out and actually change people's minds in order to get where you need to go from from here? And I would argue AI in general is in that area right now that, uh, that some of it can be broadly recognized needed policy change. I think some of it fits people's intuitions, but this is a lot, at least when we've, when we've started to do our work in this, a lot of what we're hearing is people are still forming their opinions, right? That, that there's a lot of a wait and see approach to where people are. So this is really any AI policy change outside of very technical 
sides of this are probably at a point where we are now in the change people's minds campaign, which unfortunately is the hardest, longest, most difficult uh, place to be when you when you talk about campaign change. It could quickly turn to an emergency policy change. And if that's the case, like we have to change tactics pretty quickly uh, in order to meet that moment where it is. But it's not there right now. It is definitely a change people's minds campaign. Um, second thing, so I'm going to pause there. Does, does that, does the choosing the island thing make sense to everybody? They are. I mean, they kind of are. I mean, honestly, emerging policy change can often be the easiest thing to get past. Although if you look at, say, school shootings, that's an emergency policy change where the NRA has built up a really good game plan right afterwards to do kill job. So um, they can they can be ranked separately. But in general, that is from easiest to hardest. Any other questions here before I move on to the second bucket? Okay. I'll just remind people online, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or ask them in the Q&A. And if somebody raises the hand, you'll tell me? Okay, great. Thank you, Hannah. Okay. Uh, second part is identify your winning message. Uh, this one is like always me being the harshest to experts in the room. You are awful at knowing your best message and you think that you are great. And I will say that in rooms about equestrian policy, I will say that in rooms about cannabis policy, I will say that in rooms about AI policy. You've been thinking about this so long that the conversation in your head is at least five years ahead of the conversation in anybody else's head. Uh, and that includes uh, legislators, uh, but it certainly includes when legislators have to go home and talk to their constituents about it. And so the message that you believe is most salient is not going to be the message that is most salient for policymakers who have to hear it, which is extremely difficult. And it is one of the hardest things about translating from subject matter experts, people who know what is the best thing to do, and those policymakers who have to make those decisions. So I always give this warning, which is don't be a Cassandra, just by a show of hands. Who knows who Cassandra is from Greek mythology? All right, so that does okay. Cassandra is uh, a, uh, a, a, I don't think prophet's the right word. Uh, um, yeah, she's a seer who's who's cursed. Um, she's she's cursed that no one's ever going to believe her. So she predicts the future at the beginning of Greek tragedies. She tells you exactly what's going to happen. She tells the main the the main protagonist exactly what's going to happen. The protagonist doesn't believe that person, and then that's exactly what happens. That is unbelievably apt when it comes to subject matter experts in policy. Um, you guys often do predict the future very, very well. Uh, and then no one listens to you. And then as things unfold, it's like, well, here are the predictable outcomes of the things that uh, should be unfolding here. And you can feel good about knowing that you are correct, um, but you can feel bad about the fact that you didn't make the world a better place. So uh, I always like, this is like my harshest cold water, which is like, you have to get into rooms uh, and hear from people uh, that have not been in the conversation for very long and figure out what works for them. Thankfully, we've done some of that work in AI and we're here to help in that work in AI. And I think that's a main uh, kind of opening salve that we are hoping to bring in Fathom. Bree? Yes. <laughs> Andrew, why can't we just get subject matter experts directly in a room with policymakers, answer all their questions and fix this that way? A yeah. really direct route. I mean, first of all, that is a tactic that we should use and we and and we do use, right? At the right times and the right places when lawmakers are properly briefed and framed on what where they need to get to from this and they have messaging they can go back to their constituents on. Oftentimes, a subject matter expert in the room is very helpful. It's a very trusted uh, messenger, particularly if you're not, you know, set up to make a whole bunch of money from from the endeavor, right? The, those those people are gold. Um, the problem is uh, that um, at that moment you have to have a lot of scaffolding around you. A, you have to be set up in a position where there's now a platform where that legislator can actually do something with it. Uh, and translate it to action. Because you could come and say a whole bunch of some, tell this person there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to happen in the world. That person is not a magician. They need to know, okay, 
tell me the next three things I have to do that would be helpful to you. Um, the second part of it that goes more to the messaging is e some, some legislators are going to be up on their game and you can go and talk to them and they are like, I got it. I've already spent, you know, a hundred hours of my life thinking about this issue and I'm, I'm up and running with you. Some are going to be like, I honestly don't really know what AI is. Um, and like, I've taken this meeting as uh, a thing and I have like five other meetings after this. And you're not leaving me something that I think I need to go talk at my town halls about in any way. So I'm going to take this meeting. It's going to go in one ear and out the other. We will send you a thank, thank you follow up. And, and that's kind of not impactful. So the question is then, how do you have impactful messaging when you come in? Um, that is, uh, unfortunately, uh, hard work to do. Um, my best tools that I have for it is actually good old, first, good, good old fashioned focus group testing. Uh, and we've done a lot of it. Um, it is a lot of listening sessions. Fathom at kickoff just did uh, 100 listening sessions in like 50 days kind of thing. Um, uh, but you do have to go out and test your message and you do have to go out and test it in somewhat rigorous manner to know how it's actually uh, res resonating. The third one is you have to build a winning uh, coalition. And the heavier the lift, the more people you need. Um, and again, you have to remember a kill is the easiest. So uh, if I have to build a winning coalition and I have thought through my policy change, I realize that I have to, let's say, change people's mind uh, and that it's likely that you know, three Fortune 10 companies are going to come out against this, for example. That's a large coalition you're going to need to build, right? That if you really want to think about on a, on a national level, that there's a lot of work you're going to have to do to get a lot of voices on online to be a, a countervailing force to that. Um, the, the most important part of it, we'll double click in, in what it takes to, to grow a coalition after this one. Um, but the most important thing I would say to this is building a coalition is often confused with um, finding alignment with, uh, with um, similarly situated actors. So oftentimes what we end up doing when we think we're building a coalition is we're going back inside our echo chamber and we're building alignment. Alignment's a, ne a necessary part within the echo chamber, but that is not actually coalition building. So we do have to like, how are we bringing in more voices? Uh, and then the fourth one that I just give to, um, uh, again, groups when I used to be pitching them my services is the, pro the plural of tactic is not strategy. Um, so oftentimes I will come in to a room and, and somebody will say like, uh, well, I heard that like money is politics. So why, why don't we just have a giving program? And if we give enough money, cer certainly we'll get our way. Um, that, uh, that is kind of an old school way of thinking about politics. Um, giving money is a tactic. Uh, it's not a bad tactic. It's in oftentimes a necessary tactic. Um, getting up and running with a paid media presence is a tactic. It's not a bad tactic, sometimes needed tactic. It doesn't feed into a larger strategy. The basics of a strategy have to include, are you winning the narrative? Wherever you have to be winning the debate, are you actually winning the debate in those rooms? You can, you can somehow, you can take one temperature of that via polling, but you know, there's other parts of the narrative. You have to like, are you winning the, the narrative inside the beltway? Are you winning the narrative amongst um, key stakeholders uh, in the Democratic Party? Are you, you know, there's a lot of different ways you have to think through. Are you winning the narrative? But that's one key part plank of, uh, of creating strategy. The second is, are you building surround sound? Are you able to get to key decision makers um, and have other people around them say that your idea is a good idea? Um, so that it's not just you speaking out over and over again saying this is the right thing, but have you actually galvanized a troop of trusted messengers um, or the public in general to be making noise about this such that uh, a policy maker has to listen? And then three, do you actually have a, a program up to influence key targets? So if that's passing US legislation, you're thinking like, do we have the right lobbyists in place? Um, if we look at key le uh, legislators here, do we know how to get through the right committees? Do we know how to win a vote on the floor? Do we know how to 
um, uh, make sure that the right person in the administration is clued in so that they don't send the wrong message down um, through everybody. It, do you actually have the apparatus to uh, influence those, those key targets? So that, in essence, is the anatomy of a successful campaign and all the things you have to put together. Does that all make sense? Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody have any thoughts, any pushback? Hello? Can you hear me? OK. Um, so it kind of sounds like this is when you know what you want to achieve. Totally. Um, and then I, and it seems like there's also a part where we don't know what we want to achieve. Yeah. Um, so like, are you are you doing both pieces of this? Or how does this fit together? So sense making and coming to solutions that matter is not going to be my, a part of today's presentation. It is an incredibly important part. You have to, unfortunately, all, at all times, and it's very hard to do, keep both things in mind all the time what, when you're creating policies. Because if you don't have this lens when you're creating your policy, you're going to end up with a policy that is, um, or a, an idea that is unimplementable. And so, uh, in my opinion, the only like responsible way to do policymaking is to continually iterate beside each other. What is a policy that's actually going to make a difference and going to help the world? And is this a winnable policy? Can I build the, ana the, the anatomy of a successful campaign around this? Um, I'm happy to come back at a different time and have my idea about how you do um, consensus building amongst broad stakeholders to get them to uh, good ideas, which is, I think, an art form in and of itself, um, because uh, that is, I think, a part of what we all have to do here is like, how do you bring the public along? You're not going to pull the public and get a very good answer on how they see AI governance, right? That That's not the purpose of polling. Um, so how do you hold a conversation that in my, in my terms, breadcrumbs them in the, into the right direction? But yes, this does assume that you know which island you want to land, land on. So uh, one debate I've, I've seen recently on Twitter and on in person is people saying, okay, we need AI regulation now versus saying, okay, we're actually still fundamentally confused by what AI regulation is needed, what safety standards should be. And in any case, most of regulation that's going to happen is basically off the back of an emergency. So it's kind of emergency policy change you're talking about. I and mean, you know, I think a powerful example of this was doing something like the Patriot Act was passed within, I think, a, a week or so of 9-11, of whereas you know, other things have taken years to get through. So when there is an emergency, and I hope it isn't an AI emergency, but I think a lot of people in this room think there's going to be one, maybe the federal government can actually move swiftly and decisively. So this is maybe a fairly high-level question, but yeah, to what extent do you think that meaningful AI regulation is going to come from this slow kind of coalition building versus something big happens, the public wakes up, and then we need to have a policy proposal basically in the filings or already for that kind of event? Uh, breaking case of emergency is an extremely important part of scenario planning here. Um, I, one way this can unfold is that this starts as a changing people's minds campaign and moves into an emergency policy change. One thing I always urge people on that is um, you have to be very prepared for an emergency policy change. More than just like, here's the right policy, like here is a group of people ready to be actually engaged and activated, ready to talk about that. So I, I urge people not to give up on the changing people's minds part of the, the campaign, because that's actually the muscle that will matter when it gets into an emergency situation. The thing you won't want in an emergency situation is an uninformed public ready to point fingers all, around, all over the place on what needs to happen next and not being aligned. So like a good example of that, I hate to bring it up, but like the pandemic response, right? Um, at that point, we hadn't built up a huge amount of muscle on what the everyday American should think of is a responsible approach to the pandemic response. And so pretty quick, quickly became politicized and a lot of the next steps became about what side of an ideological step you, you stood on. So gaining consensus ahead of time and starting to grow 
unusual bud fellows who view this problem similarly, such that if in a bad case, this becomes an emergency policy change, you actually have an apparatus to not politicize it and actually move forward positive change. Thanks. Thanks. Um, just to maybe kind of play this through an example, do you have any reflections on which parts of this framework, either the proponents or opponents in SP 1047 are kind of like doing particularly well or poorly on? I, I was like, uh, Bree should talk about 1047 more. Uh, um, 1047, which Fathom has no point of view on, and I can tell you why Fathom has no point of view on. The most important part is that we just started existing like five days ago. So, um, and we, and also it doesn't go to our theory of change to have staff weigh in on a, on where it is. That's all about recruiting and having a bigger group. But 1047, as an outside observer, has defied the laws of gravity in some really important ways that I think are really great to watch. Um, a, I don't believe that it did a ton of coalition building outside of the echo chamber. And I do believe that that, um, that became part of the narrative as it was moving forward and part of the weakest time of the policy debate. There was a whole period of time where there was kind of an onslaught of students from higher, edu uh, higher education um, uh, groups. There was just a whole bunch of places where, where, they, where opposing was coming on, in from. And the voices that were for it weren't growing at the same time, right? There, it was the same types of voices who had kind of always been for it and maybe like a, a little bit uh, of a grower. That changed two days ago um, and I think is extraordinary uh, as to um, uh, uh, both um, the political powers uh, that have kind of come together behind it and decided and decided to push through kind of a, a lot of slog in order to, to get there. Um, but also, um, I think there were some honest, good faith efforts out there in uh, in industry that have been a little bit surprising. Um, so I do think like Anthropic was an actual surprising good faith effort. I think the the vast majority of industry thought that this was a pretty easy kill job um, and that um, the ability to kind of cleave uh, in between what they thought was their coalition has given this thing new life um, in a way that, that could uh, make it out there. So I would put that somewhere in that seemed like it was going to be a simple kill. Um, it was probably broadly needed broadly recognized needed policy change. You can see that by the, what, 35 to one vote that got it out of the, the Senate side. Um, and then they just thought that there, there'd be a pretty easy place to kill it. And then suddenly the coalition to kill it was cleaved in, uh, up a little bit. And I think people are kind of scrambling because of that. And I think it's been uh, a surprising um, part of that. Um, any other, is that enough color behind how that fits in that framework? Okay. One thought I would have is that some people um, would think that uh, the thing we need from policy eventually will be an extremely high bar. Um, and my, I would like you to talk about sort of instrumentally, if you, if I think I have, we have to get to it an extremely high bar eventually, um, does sort of getting something incremental <laughs> that um, say, I think solves like 2% of the problem, yeah. but might be perceived by a bunch of people as solving 70% of the yeah. problem. Um, is that helpful or unhelpful? Um, yeah, thoughts around that. Love this question. And I should have included my incremental um, slide because it is, this is, again, not uncommon to any policy debate. Is incremental better than, is, is incremental better than nothing? Essentially is always the question. Do we focus on incremental or are we going to um, sell ourselves out of what's truly needed and people are going to think that the policy is solved? So here's the two ways of thinking about that, right? Um, one, we're going to solve, we're going to pass something. It is, you know, I've lined up all of the risks associated with this. It solves almost none of the risks. Um, and we're going to end up in a situation where what we've created is essentially a wash and we are in a bad place. Let's just say that that's where it is. Um, meanwhile, we've used up all of our political capital. There's no way we can come back for a round two and ask uh, legislators to take a painful vote again um, and be in the middle of this thing again. Uh, and so we're gonna go have to take a break for three years before we can come back 
And we're gonna have to build up goodwill all over again in order to get to another piece of meaningful change. So better to not pass this and go take a deep breath and come back with something that works better. That is a perfectly reasonable way to think. The second side of this, which is also perfectly reasonable to think, is wins beget wins. We are building up a coalition. We are showing sides of, uh, uh, of how to move forward here. There is some good that will come out of this and we couldn't step up a perfect regulatory regime tomorrow anyway. So we need government to start building muscle. And so if there are more people hired in government to start thinking about this and more, more groups engaged in this, that's nothing but upside. And it allows us to come back and have an iterative conversation and build something big. Also perfectly reasonable. What I look for in between them to decide which world we, we are in is, is your coalition bigger after you've passed this or have you essentially broken it up? Is what is what is where you're going to get to after this that um, uh, that everybody will be so spent that they say, please don't bring me back again on this for a long time? Or have you now discovered new people and is there a politics of addition here? And that's the judgment call you have to make um, to decide whether or not you're in good incremental or bad incremental. I do have it other slides too, but I love the conversation, so we should keep going. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, I'm not an expert on US um, political theory at all, but so this might be quite naive, but I feel like it's very difficult to get like federal legislation passed in the US yeah. and like there hasn't really been any passed since like Obamacare. So, and it seems like that's mostly because of the very highly polarized like nature of the, the federal government. So it seems like, a lot of people have this view that like you just really need to make sure that your um, issue doesn't get like pol polarized in this way. And so almost it makes a lot of sense to be extremely risk averse with like how you're sort of messaging things to sort of try and avoid this issue where you're sort of dooming stuff to like not being able to be legislated, I guess. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, I will, the, the pushback I'll give on it is Obamacare is not the last time a major thing has been passed. It might be, the, I mean, first of all, like, if, like there have been issue specific things like tax cuts that have, that have been passed that have been highly controversial that kind of get pushed through. Um, but um, uh, the um, induction, uh, the uh, reduction, the Inflation Reduction Act um, is a good example of passing environmental policy under IRA. So it's probably the single biggest environmental bill that ever got passed. Um, it got passed as part of a package to bring down in, uh, inflation. Um, that goes to your second point very well, which is oftentimes you have to look for unique framings to get things through. Environmentalism has been stuck in the mud forever, um, but um, there was plenty of opportunity um, under uh, a much bigger issue to find ways to pass a lot of the policies um, uh, put under them. Yes, I think that um, we are dealing, my crystal ball shattered uh, in 2016, um, uh, as did I think many people's. Um, so I no longer try to predict the future, but I will say I think there's a, a fairly good amount of certainty that Congress will remain dysfunctional um, in the next Congress, right? Like, I think I'm, I'm fair enough to say that, which means you are dealing with a lot lower amount of legislation that go, gets through. Um, and you have to be like setting yourself up for um, a lot of like, how do I speak to this about Republicans? How do I speak to this about Democrats? How do I pull this out of um, any specific champion who is way too far coded on one side or the other? Um, or do I bring in two people coded from vastly different parts of uh, of Congress, so that this can continue to to move forward. But yes, it does speak to flexibility and and broad framing. Great. I'm gonna move on just a second. Double clicking in coalition building. Um, I just want to like leave with some of these things because I think this this should always all always be in your mind. You have to recruit from outside the echo chamber. That is on all of us to always be looking to recruit outside the echo chamber. Um, you can spend forever having debates about wedge issues inside your own echo chamber. Um, and that can be the job you, you, you can have. Or you can just recognize that wedge issues exist within your echo chamber 
And your job is to get people who are currently not interested in your issue interested. Um, uh, so I always say politics is a game of addition. If what you're bringing me is a way to further wedge issues, um, I'm going to use that as a tool against you. But I'm not I like I'm not interested in figuring out how to make it through that wedge. Right. It's a, a, a time that you can be spending. You can suck all your time into wedge issues within your echo chamber and really lose out on building a winning coalition. The second is that means you have to find a way to set your constitution in a way that doesn't focus on wedge issues um, and doesn't get down to the minutia. I have a group of, of, um, of documents that I create when I am coalition building. Um, I call the first one the Articles of Confederation because they're meant to be thrown away pretty quickly uh, within the whole thing. And there's a lot you can complain about them with, but it's hard to get up and talk in front of people if you don't say what you stand for or at least hum the first few bars. So Articles of Confederation are like, here's what brings us here today. Here's the general gist of who we are and why we're here. <clears throat> the second is once you actually start to get members to want to join you, you then start to talk, to, talk through non-negotiables. Okay, we know it is that we generally brings us together. What would absolutely cause us to split up this coalition? What are our lines in the sand that you cannot imagine a world where this coalition could stand for X policy without it that being the end of the coalition. Um, so if you can see 10% of the time where you would say, that's actually okay as long as it's paired with this, that's not a non-negotiable. It literally has to be something that you could say, if this group ever stood for a policy that did X, Y, or Z, we should break up the coalition tomorrow. From there, you move to principles. Okay, that's the negative view of who, who we are. What's the positive view? If we had to paint a picture of what we want to see this world look like in 10 years, these are the principles that we would um, have around it. And then finally, you come up with a governance of decision making um, so that everybody who's joining, becoming a member, feels like and actually does have a say in how you're moving forward, but you've kind of cleaned up. You're not going to be involved in every day-to-day -day decision unless you're this person. Um, here's the broad decisions you'll be involved in. Here's the way a vote would go. Here's where we'll need unanimity. Here's where we'll need majority rule. You have to clear up all that stuff. Third thing you have to do is once you have a coalition, it's not just enough to have a coalition. Um, there's a lot of coalitions out there with a lot of really big names. You actually have to have a mini campaign within your coalition at all times where you're growing interest and salience of this issue amongst your members. So I could go out and convince, come up with somebody that like Dow Chemical that they should really care about AI. And I could have a conversation with Dow Chemical where I do convince the like head of policy for that day that they should care about AI and they sign their name to the coalition. From that point on, I have to continue to convince all of Dow Chemical that they should be interested in this and that it should be a salient issue within their group. Otherwise, they're not actually activated. And you have to continue to think that through all the way. Again, not enough to get them signing on and dot, dotted line. You unfortunately have to continue to rouse up your own, your own people in there. And then finally, this doesn't always have to be a super formal party. Like you don't have to put on tux every time and, and have like 30 documents and have, you know, procedures and rules. And, and the bigger the problem, the more I suggest you actually work to get that running. The smaller the problem or honestly, state level campaigns can really do a lot more of this informally um, and, uh, and feel like and, and hit the spirit of a lot of these things on its way to a winning bill. Um, bills at the state level are a lot easier to pass. Um, I would say like one one thousandth of the lift that a that a a, a government bill is to pass or a, a U.S. government bill is to pass. Um, so you probably don't want to put as much effort into those things, but you should be clicking in on all these things along the way. Any other questions here? Okay. Um, Fathom is um, starting to try to build the island of uh, bringing people's uh, minds to the table I, um, uh, and trying to build that uh, uh, coalition outside of, of the echo chamber. Um, it is starting really with listening and sense building um, in new communities that have not so far been in, uh, involved in, in AI. Um, I would love to, we've so far uh, gone through interviews, focus groups, pollings, um, uh, and uh, we, we have one more poll we're putting in the field 
uh, leading all the way up to um, a kind of capstone project we'll have on like, here's the current state of the Overton window, um, uh, both quantifiably and qualifiably uh, throughout America. You can have that to look forward to and we will send you that report when it goes out. But I was going to take the moment um, just to kind of run through some key findings here uh, that we have from it. Um, the, the first is, um, it is remarkable when you talk to any focus groups outside of DC or Silicon Valley, how they view AI. Um, it is, uh, um, first of all, a very tepid mix of uh, positive, negative, and um, totally agnostic. And it's like a third, a third, a third. Um, it does um, skew, the, there's no partisan divide, there is an age divide. Um, so as you uh, get older, they're more skeptical. As you get younger, they're more optimistic. But other, other than that, it doesn't matter which way you do the, the cross tabs, or if you're talking to a group of Trump, uh, outside of DC Trump Republicans, like we have, or a group of outside of DC liberals, which we have, they remain with that feeling towards AI. Um, uh, they also all view it as uh, an over, a slightly overhyped efficiency tool. Um, there is a little bit uh, around um, uh, agency that they kind of start to talk into where they're like, I, I feel like I would feel a little uncomfortable if this started to take over deeper things. I know that I don't want it in, in charge of the creative arts. I'd rather have it figure out how to do my laundry. Um, that was like a direct quote from the focus group. Um, uh, but like in general, we think that um, all, like most of what we've been hearing is that this is like in a boom cycle and there'll be a bus cycle coming. And it's like, you know, an addition to it. Um, the second thing is when you actually dig into where they're concerned, they're most concerned with uh, misinformation, disinformation, and deep fakes, and uh, with a, a, a follow-up concern about AIs making decisions without human oversight, which I would put into like kind of a, some feeling about agency. When you are in the discussion with them, they really are talking about AI almost as like the next step from social media. That's really a lot of the key context that they get for what they view AI as a technology uh, as, is that you know first you had social media, you have the same companies that were involved in social media, involved in AI. And when I think about AI use in context, in context I'm mostly thinking about it on social media platforms. And I'm thinking about it with the same problems that I think about it uh, with social media. Um, the third, uh, uh, which was mentioned before, uh, is that voters believe that the federal government has a role to play. This was actually remarkable. Um, Trump Republicans openly said the word regulation outside of DC. Actually, inside DC, the, like once they knew that we were considering regulations, the focus group, once they knew we were considering regulations as part of uh, things we should uh, we would go forward with, they were like, this group can go burn in hell. Um, and uh, and I think one of, one of the consultants wrote on the side like, this group wouldn't want to regulate fire if they were on fire. Um, and that's true. It's a very ideological group uh, of, uh, and, and a way you should probably think about inside DC, Republicans are very libertarian bent and uh, regulation is a four letter word inside of DC, which is probably a reason to work the word regulation out of your vocabulary. But if you do step outside of DC uh, and you have that conversation with Trump Republicans, they're like, yeah, I think government has a clear role to play with this. They should be regulating this. I'm really worried about big tech. I'm really worried about um, uh, um, uh, jobs and, and things in general. And it does feel like government has to have a, a role. With the same breath, they'll say like, no way government can do this. Like they will be awful at it. And I don't want to see them doing it. I also don't want to see the companies doing it. So good luck. You know, like, I mean, essentially they have no answer there for that. Um, we presented them with a broad coalition of inside experts and outside experts with people at the table. And there was general agreement that that would be a good way to go forward with it, but no, no view of what that would mean or, or how that would be implemented. Um, the last one to say is, oh, no, I said all of them. Um, I'm happy to go through each one of these um, uh, as, uh, as they came up, but I wanted to just run through 
<clears throat> this is as we gave them a list of very important, somewhat important, uh, and total and um, not important at all. Um, this is the lists of um, uh, of from the top to the bottom of how how they thought <clears throat> these things should rank in terms of importance. Now we gave this to them. They didn't come up with it by itself, and I'm happy to talk about why it's probably a lot more important um, to know what their off-the-cuff answer would be rather than seeing a list. <clears throat> but uh, preventing artificial intelligence from acting on its own is, I think, to the benefit. That's number one. Um, pri uh, private uh, privacy issues is number is uh, equally weighted um, uh, within the margin of error. Um, does not undermine the democratic process. Raised very high. Um, uh, people should be, uh, artificial power and intelligence should empower, uh, should be used to empower people rather than, uh, replace or displace them. Um, and then prevent artificial intelligence from, in, uh, encouraging social division and isolation. All of those were kind of the very top, just in the next, uh, group where, um, there were statements below 50%, very important is, prevent artificial intelligence from being used to reinforce biases, prevent the use of artificial intelligent models by bad actors, oversight of AI should not uh, undermine American innovation, um, and it should strengthen our national security through the use of artificial intelligence. But I will say, these are very high numbers. Um, and uh, um, even like a national security number that's up at 74%, uh, national security thing that's up at 74%, that's like just a very high number for a foreign, uh, a foreign issue um, rather than uh, in your own backyard issue. So um, kind of everything is polling high right now, which what that tells me is that people are still making sense of it, right? They're not digging their teeth and saying, that's important at the exclusion of that. Um, if you ask them what's more important, they'll tell you which one is more important. Um, and they would rank, um, uh, say, preventing artificial intelligence from acting on its own over strengthening our national security from the use of artificial intelligence. Um, so if you put them head to head, you would come up with this with a number that I think would look great. But that's not really the story. They kind of think everything is important right now. Um, and the best way I have to, to, to see all of this is they really, they they feel like they're at a wait and see moment in the world, but they're also uncomfortable because they know AI is moving fast. So I, I, the, the way I'd love to brand it is instead um, it's uh, um, engage and, and scenario plan rather than wait and see. Like people want to be engaged. They want to be savvy. They want to understand where this is going and they want to be prepared for it to go in a bad direction um, and, and be there. Um, they don't necessarily think it will. And so they have to kind of uh, be brought along in the conversation. That was it. I rushed through that. Is there anything like, is there anything from polling that you want me to do a deeper dive on? Yep. Just a quick question. Were there any things that didn't poll well in these like 70 numbers in this mm -hmm. list or just everything that you see. asked them had high, nope. high numbers? Everything passed like, which is again, Probably not the best sign. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you can look and you can be like, wow, my issue pulled super high. That's really great. And it's like, yeah, but kind of right now, everybody's like, yeah, everything's important in AI. AI seems really powerful and I want to make sure everything goes well. Um, uh, I was trying to think of that. Um, yeah, that's not worth going into. Thanks. That's a really great talk. I have a question about the org as a whole. Totally. Like, um, what do intermediate wins look like for you guys? Where there's sort of feels like there's this theory of change that you like build a whole coalition and then like find what they can agree on and like introduce policy or something, um, like translate that into action. But that's like a first you do this, then you do that, then you do that, and it's all kind of like yeah. sequential. But what do like intermediate wins look like that are short of that? So uh our intermediate wins are finding the solutions that matter. And so we have a, a, a lot of standards behind what that means, but essentially finding solutions within the Overton window that both key stakeholders would say that's um, an issue that's worth dealing with today, that to the point from the gentleman in the back, 
grows the coalition and doesn't shrink it, but actually adds an incremental win that um, that would that would grow mu muscle. So is a, a power of addition, um, and um, sets us up for kind of breadcrumbing to success down the road of essentially like if we think through what our mutually agreed on end on optimal state is here, this is a uh, towards that path. So we've set the goal internally that we'll have five solutions that matter by the end of this year. Um, that then we are set up uh, to push for um, the beginning of next year. Part of that as well is engaging mutually agreed on messengers and thought leaders of putting together uh, what matters there. But um, very clearly, like Fathom has to start putting forward sense making that's powerful um, and makes a difference. Um, quick follow up. So this, the result would be like signaling that these are the things that matter. So like an open letter or something like that. Yeah, I mean, Fathom, uh, first of all, like Fathom right now is its staff and Fathom needs to become its members. Um, and that's a bit of a process, right? Like we, um, so those members then have to say, this is what, this is what matters. Uh, and we all mutually agree and both Fathom's name on it is, is on it, but so is a whole bunch of other organizations and, and groups. Um, uh, the actual political side about this, the five, like a potential 501c4 is probably a conversation for a different day on on what it will take to move towards what what more activated coalition building looks like to actually pass those things. Thanks. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what what is the likely first mover between you know the public hasn't really made up their mind. I think politicians don't really know how to go about regulating or not regulating it. Who are the who are the people that we should be convincing first? Do, do the, does the public need to be convinced before the politicians or the other way around? Yeah. Um, so I I can tell you the politicians want to be made savvy. We, I, we've I, we've spent the last uh, uh, three weeks in conversations. I must have met with uh, over sixty Hill staff at this at this point in a very brief period of time, and the Hill staff that I've known for a, a very long time in different places. The thing that I think rang true that we heard from all different corners is in no other issue area have they taken more meanings and known less what to do with um, than AI. So they feel like they are hearing a lot of future prediction um, that they can't go to their bosses with because they just can't make sense of that future prediction. Um, and they it's not that they don't, they're like, I listen to stuff, I'm concerned, but like, it's not helping me become smarter in this or brief my boss smarter. And so right now, I think the biggest opening job with probably just U.S. policy, like take all of California conversation, which is clearly at a different place in this conversation, right? California has the most active bill in the world and, and is in a different part. But if you're talking about U.S. Congress, the job right now is to help U.S. Con congressional staff become savvy at AI, teach them up on it, teach them up on the issues they should be looking out for, teach them up uh, on how to get smarter. Key stakeholders that are messengers that are gonna matter, which, which are everywhere from uh, Fortune 100 companies to the civic organizations that are in their backyard, they need to start growing a point of view soon. And I would help them grow a point of view. I think that's probably of the chicken and egg of this moment. Um, the one that you probably need to get to first, right? Is like, how do you start to get them to say, I don't know, I don't want to put myself all the way out there and be in this land, but I do think we need to at least be doing, seeing more transparency and more accountability, right? Like, I know that there are first few steps to take here. And not only do I think that those are smart, I actually think they're important. And I'm actually going to utilize my membership and my uh, lobbyists to actually go say that's smart. Um, that that to me is a probably more important next step. Cool. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that people were kind of seeing like comparing AI with like uh, social media and stuff. Uh, do you have takes on like the role of like getting people to see this as maybe a much bigger deal, like trying to like maybe somewhat prepare them for a potentially pretty crazy future? 
Yeah, I think the <clears throat> breadcrumb I would be focused on there <clears throat> is to prevent artificial intelligence from acting on its own. Um, I think that there is um, a conversation to have which is essentially asking the question, what does it mean to be your own agent? And when do you feel like you've given up your agency control? Um, and just starting to get people to define the boundaries of where they believe that that is true or not true. My intuition there is that you're going to start to see them draw conclusions of where they think that not only do I not want to give up that control, but now, you know, if we give that control, if we give that ability to um, uh, an AI, um, that's an arena where humans can kind of no longer enter because it's now become that they, they've now been essentially relegated to the side sidelines. My intuition is that people actually want to have that conversation and figure that stuff out. Um, but, um, uh, that's the next part of polling and sense making we're doing, um, to try to figure out, oh, what a great moment to end. Are we at time now? Uh, yes, that hits the end of the hour. So um, I understand you're going to be around for another uh, few minutes um, yep. before popping off. Um, so thank you everyone for attending and thank you very much for speaking. It's really great that you guys do this. Thanks for having me.